Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and sitting next to me is a gentleman by the name of Andrew Jones, which I'm trying to, trying to figure out exactly what it is. What do you do? What the hell are you? Uh, I do a little bit of everything. Um, I happen to make some wine. Uh, I grow some rootstock. I work with growers all over California with plant new vineyards. Um, so uh, and basically in my travels, I found some places that had some good fruit and I thought I'd start making some wine. And, you know, it was pretty slow during the fall and why not? <laughs> we'll go for it. So I started field recordings. So you, so basically you, you spent a lot of time in the car. A you've, seen the a, car. You, you've seen a lot of vineyard sites. A little bit of everything. Everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Up and down the coast. Yeah, coast, valley, yeah. So everything. And this, and did that like instill this bug in you to potentially do the stuff yourself? Well, or was it, was it something else that stirred this pot? Well, I think a lot of the stuff has come out of, the, like a lot of the stuff with the wine and vineyard business is really ridiculous on the thought process that goes behind it. And like you'd have these like great varieties or great vineyard sites and stuff they'd find, and it was like just stuff that people. It was like an afterthought for the property mm. owner. And I was like, "That it's really good grapes. Like that makes something that people want to drink, and it tells a story." And that's the whole thing. Like I don't make. If I were making wine just for what I wanted to drink, like I, I'd be making Chardonnay Pinot all day and have you know be the Burgundian guy. But uh, you know, in the end, you know, we make everything from like we always drink. I have everything from Albarino to Zinfandel at the winery, it is, and yeah. uh, it's always like. Um, you know, but all the stuff, it's more about telling the stories of those people and those places that I found in my travels. So not, uh, I don't, uh, I don't treat winemaking like an art or anything. It's really of like, we start with good grapes and uh, if you start with good grapes, you're gonna have good wine. So, so what was the first label you started? First label was field recordings. It was all single vineyard wines that, uh, places I found in my travels. So my first wine I ever made was Jurassic Park Chenin Blanc. We were the first, uh, folks to get, um, I mean, at the time, like, the Shannon was used for, um, for topping wine. Topping wine, and, yeah. Uh, like they, the vineyard manager was like, "Yeah, you want to buy some Shannon? Go pick which two rows you want." And you know, I still get those two rows and a couple <laughs> more. But uh, um, I wish I could buy all the fruit, all the fruit from the vineyard. But uh, um, yeah, so th that was my first wine. Yeah, I started a winery ten years ago based on an old vine Shannon Blanc. So it's kind of anomaly. That's, that's not real smart. <laughs> I mean, hobby. at the time. It was, it, was a, it was a hobby thing. It was something to keep the fall busy when no one wanted to see their nursery guy. Come on, so. everybody starts their winery with $100 Cabernet, dude. Yeah, pass. <laughs> but, uh, not my thing. Well, the question is, why, why would you pass on that? You know, because you're, you're coming at it from a different angle that especially is even rarer now in California. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I do like... Um, so the thing that I have... Like, I, I mean, for me... The thing that I want to do is take, I think craft wine and boutique wine is a very special thing, mm -hmm. um, but be, it doesn't have to be expensive. It's something that everybody can afford and drink. Like everybody shops at a farmer's market now. Like right, right. going to the local farmer's market is thing. And people want that. Like you want to know that it's a soulful product, that it comes from a real person, from a real place and all that. And it doesn't like, but at the same time though, this is a delicious alcoholic beverage and mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have to be a trophy. That's one thing. I, I'm not into the trophy type thing. I, I just, uh, when uh, when the wine, when everything behind a wine is just driven by ego, like, it's just, yeah. come on, you know. So. A great tomato ain't 60 bucks. Exactly. But it can be one of the best culinary experiences you'll have. Exactly. Right, yeah, right. No, per, that's a good analogy. I haven't yeah. heard that one. I dig that. It loves to bask in the sun. It's getting full of goodness. We can talk about payment later. But anyway, <laughs> no, no, but I see where you're coming from, right? That's the whole thing. You know, like, like I loved going to farmers markets early on in my career when I, I didn't, I didn't have a pot to piss in, mm -hmm. right? But you could still go find lettuce. Yeah. You'd be like, oh my god, this friggin' salad. Yeah. No, you, you can get something like, I mean, just a little extra TLC, not yeah. such a, uh, um, you know, farming gets treated like a commodity. We have a lot of stuff that's like commodity agriculture, you talk about, but it doesn't have to be, and it, and just because it's not treated as a commodity doesn't mean it has to be expensive. So, but. You make everything from Albarino to Zinfandel. You do it all pretty damn well. Where did you get your training? How, how did you learn? Was it trial and error? Did you screw shit up and we just don't know about it? Or You know what I'm saying? Like I definitely have screwed some stuff you, up through the days. That's yeah. for, But uh, like it's not... Uh, you start with good dirt. You pick it on the right day. 
you take good care of it, it's gonna be good wine. It's not like, I mean, the, I always say like the winemaker really has like three big uh, influences on the thing and mm -hmm. it's the day to pick it. Mm -hmm. Cause whatever day you pick it, it's gonna be different. Mm -hmm. So like that is a huge thing. The day you pick it, um, the day you press it, the day you press it is really important. I think of the wine making thing, like how you handle your pressing is mm -hmm. a very big thing. And the day you bottle it. Yeah. Those are the three main decisions. Cause it, whether how you press it is gonna affect that wine for its whole life. The day you pick it's gonna affect that wine for its whole life. Like a lot of the stuff, like if you're doing punch downs, pump overs, all the different winery, all the different winery techniques, you're gonna have like good stuff at the end. Like the style of the wine might be different. Like if mm -hmm. you're a winemaker that likes to use stems, like yeah, you'll have a little bit more of a stemmy character to the wine, but it's, that's still just like how you're taking care of it. It's still gonna be, like that's nuance in one way or the other. But like for the wine to be solid or not solid, it's three decisions. Right. right. So, I don't know. I just, so, so at, at the heart of it, you're spinning good wine just slightly one direction or the other. But the key is just making good wine. Just make good wine. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's pretty and, simple. And, but a lot of that's done in the vineyard too, right? And you work with a lot of different vineyards. Yeah. So, so in between your day job, how do you actually get out to some of these places to make sure everyone's got everything dialed in, everything's under control? I mean, do you go out and see some dumpster fires once in a while? You know what I'm saying? There's a dumpster fire. Was it always burning? Well, it keeps on burning. How does that work? Yeah, so um, there's a couple things that I, I do like. Like, I prefer to work with owner operators mm -hmm. and not just management companies. Um, even though I got to, you know, if one of my management company customers were to see this video, you know, like, <laughs> um, I do believe in what management companies are doing. But like, right. when the grapes are being sold to you from the person who's actually farming the property. Um, or, and owns the property, or at least has like the long-term lease on the property, mm -hmm. I think that is a, a good thing. Um, the, uh, the, the farmer isn't just an agent out mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. that, that's one thing that I do go for as much as I can. And I'd say 75% of the fruit that we buy mm -hmm. comes from vineyards like that. Nice. Um, so that's one thing. And then just kind of the combination of the plants. Like some of the projects we've been able to take full circle from planting it to now buying the fruit back. Oh, um, nice. yeah. Yeah. And so been able to see the site. Like I get re really involved with like um, on the front end of stuff like I mean, some of my best customers, like I'm part of like the core, of, I'm a member of the team when we're developing a property. I'm mm -hmm. not just getting a call like I need 40 acres worth of Cabernet vines. It's like, well, we have these 40 acres, you know, let's be strategic on getting the right rootstock, the right variety. What should we top, do with it? Yeah. What should we do with it for the end goal? Right. And uh, so we have a lot of stuff like that. Um, but then I get fruit from a lot of vineyards that the vines are older than me. So um, right. yeah. some of that too. But I mean, just the amount of time on the road, like, I think the least amount of miles I've ever driven in a year is 40, and the, on the upper end is about 60,000 miles a year, uh, driving up and down. I do a loop, actually, where I'll start, I live in San Luis Obispo, but I'll work my way up north, and mm -hmm. I'll head up to the north coast, cut over to Lodi, and then work my way back down the valley. Right. And, or, or vice versa, but do the, do the super loop once a week. And right. so you, just, you see a lot of stuff, and like, I mean, just being out there and observing things, uh, it's, you know, it, it doesn't take a ton of time. Like, um, you know, you, you can be real efficient with it and I can go look at plantings and in between two of my plantings I'm looking at, I might go look at my Chenin Blanc vines and see yeah. how the fruit's looking. So, right. but uh, yeah. I mean, in, in this, well, here's the deal. In, in the course, in a few short years, what is it, a decade, uh, um, uh, Andrews, he's gotten the reputation of making some of the greatest bang for the buck wines in California. Uh, but the thing is, he doesn't make a whole shit pot of them, right? So it's so it, it's it's a reputation you've garnered garnered amongst the wine cognoscenti, which I think is really special, and and I think one of the reasons for it is the purity of the wines that you create. Now, when when you're looking to create wines with with a with a one in the price or low twos or whatever you want to call it, value but premium value, what 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 is the art of some of that without without dipping into the whole, you know, grocery store, supermarket, bells and whistles and tricks and that kind of shit. You know what yeah. I mean? Is it, 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 how does, I'm gonna say how does this happen, that's a vague question. But you know what I'm talking about. How, how can you create something like this at this price point? Can, can more people do it or is there, is it just your mojo that, that allows for this to happen or? I mean, I think a lot of it goes to just seeing what's going on out there with, um, you know, like areas that we focus on, like for Pinot Noir, for example, like we focus on Edna Valley and, uh, you know, Edna Valley is not in Santa Barbara County. It's not mm -hmm. part of Like you don't have to pay the sideways markup, which still yeah. exists even like that. Mm -hmm. It's still a thing. I'm uncomfortable with the whole scenario. The vineyards there can rival and even outperform a lot of Santa Barbara vineyards, but because it's in Edna Valley, you're paying 
a fraction of the price yeah. from what you would pay in Santa Barbara. And it's, you're getting something, so like just seeing some stuff, observations in the market, but then also like we do work with some unique varieties, like fiction is always a blend of some really unique grapes. Like yeah, the mm -hmm. Trigo Nacional market in California, it's uh, <laughs> not really booming. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but it makes some amazing wine and it, and right, it fits right. like a great thing in the, in the overall blend. The so overall we have some blend. of that, that stuff. And then, uh, see the opportunities that are out there and then um, just work on what we got to make the best stuff possible. Right. Yeah. Well, master blender, king of value, Mr. Andrew Jones, thank you so much for coming out with us today. Oh, thank you. This was killer. And uh, if you ever come across any of these wines, uh, you should jump on them. They're, they really are some of the greatest real values in California wine in the market today. So um, thanks for hanging out. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.